Hello children, we are back with yet another presentation and in the series of uh, revisions. Uh, today I'll be speaking on pseudophakia. Pseudophakia again is a long case. Please be aware that it is a very high frequency long case which is given in the final examination of your professional third part uh, in your third professional part one and uh, up to one in three candidates might be given this case. Since it's a long case, you will have to present your case and while you're presenting your case, this is the way you will go about it. My case has presented with a history of ocular surgery. You will have to mention uh, exactly how many days back it was done and uh, preferably with the date of surgery. And uh, then you'll have to mention that on examination, this pres patient presents with a corneal or a limbal scar with a shiny pupillary reflex indicating a presence of an intraocular lens in his mention the eye it is therefore a case of pseudophakia of that eye now pseudophakia you'll have to give the history it is very relevant to know as to why the patient has come to the hospital this will also guide you to the chief complaint of the patient and the main reason a pseudophake will come to the hospital is usually a DOV. Now this DOV can be due to any reason but it will be a dimness of vision which will, which will bring the patient to the hospital. So it is very relevant to know the duration, the progression of his dimness of vision, whether it was gradual or whether it was painful, whether it was painless or whether it was a sudden dimness of vision. Everything will give you a fair indication of which kind of a complication he was suffering from after his surgery. Now, as to examination, you will obviously have to do the general examination first and then you will have to come into the systemic examination or the examination of the visual system. So this begins with the visual acuity, both corrected as well as uncorrected visual acuity has to be mentioned here. Uh, then try to elicit an IOL reflex, do a slit lamp examination and uh, in this lamp examination attention has to be paid on the incision sites the anterior chamber the intraocular lens which is present within the iris the iris itself and the retrolental area intraocular pressure has to be mentioned and the examination of the posterior segment has also to be mentioned even if you are not doing it but you must mention whether it is normal or whether there is a there is a finding this your examiner or the examination coordinator will be able to tell you just ask him also it is very important to try to find out which kind of a intraocular lens surgery or cataract surgery or cataract extraction has been done to this patient so you will have to pay special attention to uh, the incisions which are there in the cornea and if you cannot find an incision try to find if there is any remnant of any incision on the sclera or in the limbus okay now what is pseudophagia pseudophagia literally means that it it is the presence of an artificial intraocular lens in the eye. Now, why do you say that your case is a pseudophakia? In fact, this is one question which you will definitely be asked if you're given a case of pseudophakia. Or in other words, you might be asked that what are the points in favor of your diagnosis? So first and foremost comes the shiny IOL reflex. Second is the presence of a scar in the limbus or uh, in the sclera or in the cornea. You'll have to pay special attention to the presence of scar in the cornea these days because uh, most of the surgeries are phacoemulsification. In this case, you will have two uh, scars in the cornea, in the limbus rather, which are about four clock hours apart with another larger scar in the middle or in between these two. So that is the main point of entry or portal of entry and the others are the side ports. Then the presence of a deep anterior chamber. Now, uh, pseudophakia will always produce an anterior chamber which is deeper than the phakic eye in that eye. So the best way to find this out is to compare the pseudophakic eye to the phakic eye. So this can be possible if one eye is pseudophakia and the other eye is still phakic. 
in case both of them are pseudophagic and you are given one of the i for examination it is difficult to understand whether it is uh, uh, it is uh, a deep anterior chamber now here are certain leading questions which you might then face is what is the depth of an anterior chamber in a normal eye at the center what is the range of the depth and i'll come to this later in another slide what are the causes of a deep anterior chamber in the eye what are the causes of uh, a shallow anterior chamber in the eye what are the optical effects or what are the general effects ocular effects of a deep eye or a shallow anterior chamber of the eye so these are certain questions which you must be ready with your answers because these are leading questions which will stem out of this now another one is the patient will give you a history of ocular surgery in your case and definitely there might be pay patches of atrophy iris atrophy now this is an inconsistent finding these days because surgeons now are very adept in their surgery and they hardly leave any uh, mark on their iris because uh, the this comes only when you inadvertently touch or injure the iris while doing a surgery so this is an inconsistent finding but in older patients or patients who have had their surgeries a long time back you might be having this and this might be just an additional finding now what is the cause of the shiny reflex the, this shiny reflex is something which once you've seen you'll never forget and this is a case uh, which was recorded in our own opd and let me see if the video plays just look uh, i'm just going to show you this this one the one which i'm pointing to is the third uh, Purkinje reflex and the one which is in the center is the fourth Purkinje reflex and here you can see this is basically the slit so this is, this is a, a, a wide slit but still this is the beam of the light which is there now the the direction of the movement of the beam of the light will cause the direction of the movement of in the same direction of the Swanson Purkinje uh, or Purkinje Swanson reflex in the same side which means it will be the anterior surface of the lens and the one which will move to the opposite means the beam moving this way and the image moving the other way will be the fourth Purkinje image which will come out from the and posterior surface of the IOL. Now, in a case of uh, um, cataract surgery, I mean, in a case where it is a pseudophakia where you have an IOL implanted, why is it so prominent? Now, two reasons. One is it is a very shiny surface because uh, it has been apodized and the second is that it is very smooth so this these two uh, these two factors they help to special form a specially defined and a prominent IOL reflex now this is what we, we look for and this clinches our diagnosis clinically that the patient is having an IOL implanted and just have a look at the video and see how the reflexes are moving in the different directions Okay, so the large diffuse image which you are seeing that is the first and the second Purkinje image which are uh, almost almost uh, one on top of the other uh, overlapped and this is from the anterior and posterior surface of the cornea. Naturally, it is nearer and so it it's a larger real inverted uh, uh, is a larger uh, uh, virtual image. Now the second one in which you are seeing just one why do you see one because it is the other eye of this patient which is having an immature cataract or advanced immature cataract so there is no image from the posterior side of the uh, lens once again i'm once again have a look so the image is moving the same direction as that of the beam and there is no fourth image Okay, so you might be crossed at length on the Purkinje images. So there is a lot of questions which are asked on the Purkinje images and you better be prepared with Purkinje Sanson image. So the origin of the images, one, two, three, and four, the character of the image, the brightest of the image, the dimmest of the image, the presence and absence of Purkinje images in various conditions. So the Purkinje image will be absent in case of aphakia, only the first and second will be present in case of uh, advanced immature cataract or mature cataract you will have at the most three and the brightest image obviously is the uh, is the first and second image overlapped the character of the image the first 
three images are virtual and they move in the same direction and they are erect and the fourth image is obviously a real inverted image and it moves in the opposite direction so very quickly these are the characters of the Sanson Purkinje image now what is applied importance of the Purkinje image now this is an important question and you will be asked and if you can answer you might get good marks so the first and fourth images are used in some of the eye trackers and especially in the optical uh, devices second is the first Purkinje image is used in keratometric readings in the Jawal Shiorts keratometer the fourth image can be a source of entoptic image in the eye now how what is an entoptic image an entoptic image is an image which is formed by light within the eye so you do not have anything from coming from the outside it's not an image in the real world but it is an image due to light within the eye so what happens is the fourth Purkinje image gets reflected from the concave surface of the posterior cornea and it gets back to the retina where it is seen as an entoptic image now you must be asked you might be asked about various reflexes also shiny eye reflex jet black pupil white pupillary reflexes etc so the causes of white pupillary reflexes are important could be pediatric cataracts could be all your causes of amerotic cat's eye reflex like retinoblastoma coats disease phpv and so on and so forth you might be asked about the anterior chamber depths uh, as I was telling you in some other slide in a previous slide that what would be a normal anterior chamber depth this would be around 2.5 to 3 millimeters in a normal eye at the center then the causes of deep anterior chamber the most important cause being myopia so the higher the myopia the deep, the longer the eye the deeper the the um, anterior chamber depth then you uh, it is deepest in the FA kicks uh, those who do not have the lens then you have the causes of shallow anterior chamber again you have a, a nanophthalmos which will have a very shallow anterior chamber then you have causes of unequal anterior chamber now this is very important causes of unequal ch anterior ch uh, chamber depth I mean as this in in the same eye so uh, at one point of time it will be shallow at the other or maybe at the other segments it will be deeper so this uh, obviously indicates that there is a zonular dehiscence or there is zonular rupture which causes the uh, the lens not to be seated in the anatomical place and uh, in the anatomical position and part of it is like uh, deeper into the vitreous cavity where it becomes the anterior chamber naturally becomes deep and part of it is pulled by the uh, remaining intact zonules and they come forward and pushing the entire lens iris diaphragm forward and it is here that it is shallower so this is a very nice indication or it's a very nice clinical finding in case of zonular dehydration especially after an eye trauma blunt eye trauma so uh, obviously uh, after dilating the eye we can get a, a clinical evidence that there are dehiscence or zonular uh, tears now what is aphakia aphakia is the absence of lens in the eye now what are the advantages of pseudophakia over aphakia so in why does this question arise this question arises because uh, in the course of crossing you might be asked that what if the patient were not to be given a lens uh, after surgery or after the cataract extraction so this would be your answer that pseudophakia definitely is advantageous because the visual rehabilitation is pretty early the patient is okay by the second week here almost six weeks are required in aphakia then image magnification since you have an intraocular lens almost in the physiological position so there would hardly be any image mag magnification now in FAKX there will be a lot of Im image magnification why because they put on FAKX glasses and these glasses are thick glasses which are put almost 14 millimeter anterior so anterior to the eye so that would itself cause a lot of magnification acting as a magnifying glass so the magnification is the order in is in the order of around 25 to 30 percent 
then we have optical aberrations here the optical aberrations are minimum and on top of that the the IOL surfaces are so treated that uh, the they further reduce the optical aberrations and they could also be an aspheric surface which will again uh, treat the lower order uh, optical aberrations to a large extent then uh, in in case of effecia obviously it's an external glass and so it will have all kinds of uh, optical aberration uh, and here you will be asked the various kind of optical aberrations the uh, the effect glasses produce so it could be a jack in the box it could be a pin cushion effect it could be a barrel defect uh, it could be uh, in, it could be you know uh, scotomas so these are the four kinds of optical aberrations which are produced by FAK glasses and obviously uh, field of vision field of vision will be pretty reduced because of the presence of a thick glass and in the case of I in case of IOL because they are present or they are implanted in the physiological position of the crystalline normal crystalline lens so naturally they will not impair the uh, field of vision to any significant uh, degree cosmetic obviously since it is inside the eye and the eye uh, doesn't have any uh, externally doesn't have any indication that a surgery has been done it is costive cosmetically unblemished whereas these are have these are usually rehabilitated by heavy uh, glasses and they uh, are colloquially known as uh, soda glass uh, uh, or soda bottle glasses so they have they distorted the eye uh, the um, the um, the vis the eye to a long ex to a large extent so, okay next in the course of questions you you might be asked about the types of IOL now IOLs are very broadly uh, grouped into two types these are the these are the posterior chamber IOLs and the anterior chamber IOLs now besides that there are a few special types of IOLs like the scleral fixation in IOLs you have iris supported IOLs for example the worst and sing iris claw lens you have aniridia lenses and you could even have the angle supported lenses well these angle supported lenses are basically anterior chamber lenses now types of IELTS based on the optical properties here you have monofocals trifocals multifocals and toric IELTS even in, in toric IELTS you can have a subdivision of toric multifocals and toric tri trifocals now the type of IELTS based on the material of which they are made so if you are talking of material immediately there are two types of IELTS again these are the rigid IELTS and the foldable IELTS the rigid IELTS are known as uh, are uh, made up of uh, PMMA that is polymethyl metha acrylate lenses and then you have the uh, foldable lenses or the foldable lenses are made up of silicon they are made up of acrylic could be a hydrophobic type or could be a hydrophilic type and then we have hydrogels these hydrogels have a lot of water in them and they are extreme they as uh, they are extremely thin they can be made extremely thin and they are also rollable so one of the examples being thin optics now, if you are answering very well you might then be asked about the newer IOLs or the IOLs which have just arrived and they have novel you know uh, mechanism of function so th these are the accommodative IOLs so these bring about uh, accommodation by their haptic design the second is the light adjustable IOLs they are made by Calhoun Vision a company and then you have fluid vision that is the IOLs these have you know fluid inside them and these fluids move from one chamber to the other thus mimicking the the change of shape uh, of the IOL just as in case the normal crystalline IOL does and thus bringing about accommodation so you these are a type of accommodative IOLs and the last one is the Echelet designs with proprietary diffractive IOL designings. So this causes a sort of a uh, focus or a fo elongated focal uh, distance. So bringing about uh, uh, sharp focus uh, over a long uh, range of vision. So this is by Technis uh, Symphony. So this is by uh, Abbott Vision. So this is Technis Symphony. 
pseudophagia. Now, how do you calculate the power of the IL to be implanted? Or in other words, you might be asked about what you mean by biometry. So biometry is a method of arriving at the IL power that is required to be implanted in the patient's eye uh, by measuring his corneal power that is k and his axial length of the eye now uh, this uh, these two parameters are then used in various formulae that are available and we come across a power which is known as the iol power to be implanted into the patient the process being known as biometry now can you name some of the biometry formula so Obviously, these are some of the common formula of which these are Binkhorst, Colin Brander, SRK1, SRK2, SRK by T, Hoffer Q, Holade 1 and 2, Hages, Olsen, Barrett Hill. So these are some of the common formulae of which the first two are old formula. So they are hardly used now. And SRK1 and SRK2 are used ex extensively in India, though these are now no longer used when cataract surgery is slowly becoming a refractive surgery. So the 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 biometry formulae which are now commonly and used extensively are SRK by T, Hoffer Q and Holade 1. And obviously, uh, the, the most important formula that is used in torics and multifocals is Barrett Hill formula. Now, SRK stands, as you can see, for Sanders, Redsolf Red and Kraft. Now again, if you're answering really well, you might be asked uh, which formula to be used in which eyes. So I have just tabulated this. Uh, you can just go through it. I'm not going to read it out from the slide. So this is an important uh, slide regarding biometry. So it's better that you know this. Now there are conditions, especially in our country, where biometry is not possible. In camp setting, uh, biometry might be difficult or there are certain areas which, which we really do not have instruments and the support that is required, but yet uh, surgeries are carried on. In such a case, what do you do about the IOL power? It is here that we use an empirical IOL power and that is plus 19 diopter lens so uh, it is seen that about 80 percent of the population will be emotropic if they are implanted with a plus 19 diopter lens and hence with that premise we prescribe this power and use it empirically in places where biometry is not uh, available but still it it should be known and you should know that biometry is a must and it is basically medical legal these days if you're doing a surgery especially if you're implanting an IL with Without doing a biometry. Now you might also be asked about the types of cataract surgeries you know. So types are intraocular, uh, sorry, intracapsular cataract extraction and extracapsular cataract extraction. Now the difference between the two very quickly is when the cataract along with the capsule of the lens is extracted then it is known as an intracapsular cataract extraction and if only the cataract the cortex the nucleus is extracted leaving behind the uh, capsule of the uh, nucle of the lens then it is known as the extracapsular cataract extraction now extracapsular cataract extraction has uh, come a long way and it has evolved so these are the various kinds which are uh, all subgroups of extracapsular cataract extraction so these are SISCS or small incision sutureless cataract surgery phaco emulsification with foldable IOLs, micro incision phaco emulsification surgery or micro incision cataract surgery which are which is now known as MICS and phaco net phaco net is basically a phaco emulsification surgery which is done by micro incision but it is an innovation by Dr. Agarwal from Chennai and laser phaco surgery or flax so these are femto laser assisted cataract surgeries so this is the very latest and it is it is in the real really of uh, refractive surgery because during flax we do correction refractive correction also by putting incisions at the appropriate place and the appropriate depth along the limbus now steps of the surgery you might be asked and while you are while you are being asked step of the surge steps of the surgery you might be also asked about the blocks that is the periorbital and retroorbital block 
now once we have the question of blocks very naturally you might be asked about the composition of a periorbital or a facial block and very quickly it is made up of lidocaine 2 percent with or without adrenaline uh, the question of adrenaline comes because adrenaline uh, has an effect that it limits the uh, systemic absorption because it brings about vasoconstriction now what is the uh, and uh, and this also has another effect that is it uh, it does it helps to prevent the diffusion of the um, of the this thing uh, block or the, of the anesthetic agent into the circulation thereby uh, prolonging the action of the anesthetic so uh, what is the concentration of the adrenaline that we use it is 1 in 2 lakh uh, ratio so uh, the second one is bupivacaine bupivacaine 0.5 percent and hyaluronidase that is 7.5 international unit per, me, uh, per ml now what is the role of bupivacaine now lidocaine has got a very rapid onset of action it is within minutes one to five minutes and it also has a very short span of action so within 45 to minutes to one hour its action is literally over so Bupivacaine, on the other hand, has a prolonged duration of action and it is a slow onset. So while lidocaine brings about rapid uh, onset of the anesthetic and analgesic actions, bupivacaine takes a long time to come in, but then it stays for a longer time. So you can comfortably do your surgery. Now the the, the use of hyaluronidase here is it helps to break the tissue planes to a certain extent and help penetrate the uh, anesthetic agent over the larger area of uh, soft tissue so that the block is absolute. Now, retroorbital and periorbital block. The advantages of retroorbital block. Now, uh, mark the question. It is the retroorbital block. Now, retroorbital block was a block which was usually given uh, uh, previously. So, because of its very serious disadvantage that it used to cause uh, glow perforation, number one, and number two, damage to the optic nerve, that this has been discontinued, and periorbulba um, block has now come into fashion. So what was the advantage? The advantage of retroorbital block was small amount of block is needed. Second, it, it produces less chemosis. Third is it blocks, it causes the dilatation of pupil. And fourth is the visual block it produces because the, the anesthetic agent is deposited all around the optic nerve. Now the main disadvantage as I have just discussed is that it used to cause perforation of the globe. Uh, to avoid this of course we had a blunt tipped uh, uh, needle for that but even then we did have cases of perforation of the globe and optic nerve injury. Which are the nerves that are blocked in uh, periorbital block? So this is important question. So nasociliary branches of the long and short ciliary and the lacrimal nerves so these are the three nerves or the groups of nerves that are blocked in a uh, in a peri peribulbar block now can be asked about the various regional blocks so few regional blocks as you can uh, see directly from the um, figure that is accompanying the slide so you have uh, O brain, you have NADBATH and you have uh, Van Lint facial blocks. Now, facial blocks used to be given earlier when we used to do an ECCE because a large uh, incision used to be done in case of an ECC and the 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 uh, danger of uh, optical content being prolapsed by a squeeze by the patient was a real threat so these days you have micro incision cataract surgeries you have phaco surgeries in which you just have a 2.8 millimeter incision so uh, and the surgery speed has also increased so the 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 use of facial block is uh, almost obsolete except in patients who are largely uncooperative now this is a question again which you will be asked if not here in your long case in one of the tables definitely so what are the complications of cataract surgery a good way of answering this question is you just divide it into intraoperative early operative uh, intermediate and late operative uh, complications of cataract surgery 
So what are the intraoperative complications? Um, the intraoperative complications, I'm just going to name it, uh, assuming that you have read uh, your textbooks. So just a revision. It is retroorbital hemorrhage, globe perforation, intraocular anesthetic injection, premature entry, iris prolapse, pupillary block and a tense globe, rexus tear out, zonular dehiscence during nuclear rotation, iris dialysis, uh, posterior capsular rent or a PCR, vitreous prolapse, nucleus uh, or fragment drop, and an expulsive hemorrhage. Now here is a question which is often asked by examiners that is which is the most dreaded complication of an eye surgery or a cataract surgery. Obviously it's the last one that is the expulsive hemorrhage because an expulsive hemorrhage almost al almost always leads to the loss of the eye. Now, early post-operative complication. So this could be striate keratopathy, which we call stria, then corneal edema with microbullae. You have a raised intraocular pressure, retained lens matter in the anterior chamber, post-operative uveitis, TASS or toxic anterior shock syndrome, endophthalmitis, subconjunctival hemorrhage, decentered or dislocated IOL, poor visual acuity due to incorrect biometry, choroidal detachment or kissing choroids, iris prolapse, and hyphema. Intermediate period co complication. Now, uh, just before we proceed, what would be an early, what would be an intermediate, or what would be a late complication? If you see the timeline, it is the early or the or the time from the surgery the next day of the surgery to one week would be early postoperative one week to one week to two weeks i mean one week to the third week that is a period of two weeks would constitute an intermediate uh, period of complications and anything beyond three weeks would or in some books it's written as four weeks would be a long-term complication or a late complication. So what are the intermediate period complications? These are poor visual acuity. You will be asked about the causes of this. Corneal decompensation, post-operative uveitis, yes. Raised intraocular pressure, which will now be called a secondary glaucoma. IOL drop uh, or maybe a dislocation causing a sunset syndrome. End of thalmitis, post-operative CME, that is cystoid macular edema and retinal detachment. Late complications again would be a delayed onset com end of thalmitis. These are those end of thalmitis which are caused by either fungal agents or by you know um, acne. Uh, I mean commensals in the skin like propionobacterium acne and all that. So post-operative CME again. Now comes your most important cause that is the uh, posterior uh, capsular opacity or PCO, the and capsular phimosis. Pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, secondary glaucoma, retinal detachment, epithelial downgrowth, and brown MacLean syndrome. Obviously, epithelial downgrowth is something which has really now become very less because we do a clear corneal incision. So there is no question of epithelium finding its way down into the cornea. And another is brown MacLean syndrome, which is basically an edema which used to be found in the lower part of the uh, of the limbus uh, near the six o'clock limbus. So this uh, was very common in AFA and in ECC patients. This also is hardly found these days. Now, what are the causes of uh, dimness of vision in a cataract surgery? Now, immediate post-operative causes would be a wrong biometry. Obviously, you have a wrong lens in place. Could be corneal edema, which is very common after surgery, uveitis, increased IOP, choroidal effusion, hyphema, and endophthalmitis. Intermediate and late post-op causes of dimness of vision would include a refractive error. Maybe the patient is having a very high astigmatism, PCO, that is posterior capsular opacity, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy, glaucoma, retinal detachment, uh, CME, and epithelial ingrowth. Now, this is one question which I love to ask the students. That is, what are the advantages of phacoemulsification of a SICS? And what are the advantages of SICS 
of a FACO emulsification. Now, advantages of FACO emulsification over SICS would obviously be that FACO emulsification has a very quick rehabilitation. The patients are back to their work uh, soon, within a week maybe. And second is the, the visual outcome is better and uh, the advantages of SICS over FACO emulsification being in a country like India where resources are very, very scarce to, scarce to find, uh, SICS would be a choice in high volume surgery because the turnover period or the turnover time per surgery is very less. So there are surgeons who could do almost 20 cataract surgeries in a in an hour so that could be the speed of SICS whereas FACO emulsification does take a long time in fact in comparison with SICS and secondly is SICS is comparatively cheaper because it doesn't uh, involve costly instrumentation like an FACO emulsifier and the third is that surgeon with uh, a lot lesser expertise can do good SICS and FACO emulsification would need a long and uh, 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 steep learning curve. Thank you. Now, before you turn off, I would like to point out that have a good look at the at the uh, slide at the picture which is given of the eye. So you can find that there are certain Elschnick pearls. So this patient will or might have a PCO. So these are the Elschnick pearls, and obviously you have the two uh, reflexes. These are the third and the fourth Purkinje images. Thank you, and all the best.